agree with Alan Greenspan, we ought to just eliminate the debt ceiling. Oh, absolutely. We do. The ability of almost every working American to access more credit than they should have been able to masked the underlying fact that lower and middle class incomes were not rising. That's not a tenable strategy. Isn't that the time to eliminate it? Oh, it would have been time a long time ago. Let's put aside terrorism. Let's talk only about our own homegrown animals that are patrolling America right now. So it goes down to the simplest thing. Be prepared, be vigilant. It's a beautiful day for the ignorant man. For the ignorant man around me, it's a beautiful day. And, and let me just say, I'm jealous. I'm jealous. Because once you know too much, you know too much. There's no going back. You can never find ignorance yet again. Oh, passing Columbus on my right. He's still standing. What a surprise. Monument of Christopher Columbus still standing here in my neck of the woods. Hasn't been written on, hasn't been destroyed by the the, uh, the creatures. The creatures who think that somehow by destroying bronze, they're remaking the world. By somehow kicking bronze, they're going to remake the world and it's going to play in their favor. That's just one problem on my mind. I have a holistic vision of the problems of the day right now. Apple's having a good day. Right? Apple's having a good day. The, the, the corporate gods. The corporate mandarins. When I look at Google, when I look at uh, Google, Apple, Amazon, Jeff Bezos, a.k.a. Uh, Lex Luthor, I see the mandarins of the future, the czars of our future. I see companies and corporations that are going to grow so much stronger than the United States government that the political power in this nation will be seized if not in this world. If not in the world, the political power and the people's power will be stolen. Just because we've never seen something like a corporation so big and so encompassing doesn't mean that they can't rule the world. It doesn't mean that it's, it's out of the scope. You know what I mean? The new iPhone, my wife told me this, the new iPhone opens using facial recognition. So cute. So cool. So cute. You're feeding your greatest enemy. What could one day be, and maybe not, maybe they just become a great company. You know, for some reason they don't become hell-bent on profits and power like every other giant corporation. And look, giant corporations are necessary in some aspects of our life. There's no getting around that. But these tech giants, there are some problems with them. They don't pay taxes. They don't pay what they should in taxes, okay? That's a big problem. The other big problem is we don't know where tech is going. And it's going so far over the head of the average person that I don't think anybody knows the path that they're on. You understand what I'm saying? In other words, when it comes to making sandwiches, when it comes to making hamburgers like a McDonald's. We know where that's going. We have a little bit of control over where that goes. When it comes to Google, they're just going to keep improving on technology. Whether they build Skynet or not, they're just going to keep on, you know. So we've decided with the new iPhone that we'll give them exactly what we look like. Our facial recognition will be programmed and stolen by Apple for sure. So that when you walk into a retailer, if you don't think this is real, you can look it up, but this is this is actually old technology. So that when you look and walk into a retailer, they'll be able to recognize who you are and the types of products that you buy based off of your face. They'll come to know exactly who you are. And uh, they'll take advantage of that information just like they're taking advantage of all the information that third-party sites are being sold uh, by Google. Is it too heavy? I mean, it's a little heavy. It's a little heavy for this, this kind of day. Like I said, for the ignorant man, it's a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Passing another relic here up on the left. See, we have this... We have this trail of tears in Richmond, Virginia that's called uh, Monument Avenue. And Monument Avenue is home to a giant statue of Stonewall Jackson. Which is in the crosshairs like you wouldn't believe. I'm sure you can imagine. <laughs> And the whole, the whole of Monument Avenue, except for 
uh, a famous black tennis player named Arthur Ashe is pretty much Civil War relics. So who knows how that's going to play out? Who knows? Who knows how that plays out? So we talked about the corporation. Uh, what else is looming? Well, we've got we've got about 50 bill. We've got about 50 billion wrapped up in hurricane recovery and growing and counting. My estimate is that it'll wind up being 200 billion once politicians get their hands on the bill and they put their grift in. And they sew in uh, the kickbacks to construction companies that got them votes and things like that. But, you know, funded them. Once all the kickbacks are tied in, once all your money, once they can scrape all of your money that they can possibly scrape, that, and only then, then and only then, will they nod their heads and say, all right, let's pass this thing, 200 billion, who cares? 200 bill! Eh! Eh, who cares? Ain't my money. When I think about the government, I think of a big black van, right, that says G-O-V-T on the side in white print. And the back doors, the two back doors are open. They're just two guys that look like agents from the Matrix. And they're just opening giant uh, uh, contractor trash bags and money's just falling out of the backs of the trash bags. <laughs> flying out of the backs of the trash bags hundreds hundreds of dollars per second flying out of the trash bags that's what i think when i think of my wonderful government at work and then i think about your children <laughs> i think about your children not your children from el salvador though you didn't know you had adopted some children from colombia yeah you did sure you did you adopted some young ones from Colombia, and you know what? You know what you have to do now? Oh, I'm talking about the Dreamers. I'm talking about the DACA, which we covered before. You want to know why I'm, I'm so up in arms about it? Let me tell you why I'm so... Let me tell you personal issue here. While well, I'm so up in arms about DACA. Well, first of all, it's the common sense thing. The first thing is the common sense thing. It's the idea that, okay, we have to pay for these kids. Why? Why do we have to pay for them? Okay, well, because they're in our nation. They were in our nation as children, so that means that they didn't have a choice in the matter, so that means that they're our responsibility now. And they are our responsibility. When we agree to, to DACA, be very clear, it is your responsibility and my responsibility. Taxes, taxes, taxes. This government has become such a machine with taxes that it's hard to even fathom. It is hard to even fathom. Next time, watch next tax season, see how much money they collect. You, you will be blown away. And the reason there's such an efficient machine is because we're paying for everything. 30%? You're kidding. I've got to pay 30%? State taxes on top of that? You want, you want my lifeblood, man. You want it all. They, they want all of it. They want it all. Never forget the government wants it all. And they're going to find ways to get it and they're going to find things to do with it. Now, I've heard that it takes about $400 billion to take care of these children, these dreamers. So while that money's dripping out of your pocket, I've got a lot of problems with this. Like I said, I'm, on a pro I'm just on a rampage of problems, okay? I'm getting ready to go in and watch It here in a few minutes, and I just want to empty my tank out so I can enjoy this movie. And then maybe I'll come back out after a beer and uh, talk about how I liked Pennywise. Because that, that might be, I might be in a better mood. I don't know. That's how these things work. When you're, an, when you're an adult male with responsibilities, you get into certain moods sometimes, and then you have a drink, and then you don't have that mood anymore. You don't get sloshed. You don't get shit-faced. You don't get stupid. You don't get arrested. You have a couple drinks. You know? Mood goes away. Put your armor back on, and you go back into the fight. And that's it. That's how you deal. That's how you get, get through this thing. A DACA. Here's my other problem. Had we not spent the money on taking care of dreamers and taking care of immigrants and the welfare that goes into it and all of the programs that go into it, what would, wouldn't this make you feel better? This is just something from the mind of the I Am Liberty host here. Some, some thoughts from the mind of I Am Liberty. What if we had a national campaign that promoted young, young people's 
of all ethnicities, young Americans, natural born, American citizens, there is a difference now, young American citizens to work. And monies were given to promote work in the nation and to promote young kids to get in the work. 16. Commercials on television and on YouTube about workers' permits and what they do and how, how working as a youth makes sense. And then instead of migrants and illegal aliens doing jobs, what if we glorified these jobs or what if we put some money into, into the glorification of work in our society? Because whether you want to believe it or not, whether you think that your child is so precious that he should never work until he's making six figures, work makes people better. That's all there is to it. Work makes people better. It makes them faster. It makes them more efficient. It makes them smarter. It makes them better able to handle tough situations, which life is nothing but a can of tough situations and decisions over and over again. And that's what it does for you. That's what work does for you. We've abandoned our children with work. We've been robbed. I heard, I heard, <laughs> I heard Guy Ritchie talking about being robbed. Being robbed of our ability to wear a suit. Being robbed of our food. And I really like the, I really like the phrase being robbed. Because our children are being robbed. They've been robbed of their right to work. Because of course we have to frown upon these, these jobs that illegal immigrants do. Right? We put our nose up in the air. But what? Re I washed dishes all through my childhood. All through my childhood I washed dishes. I did it for $4 an hour. Illegal. Right? 13 years old. And it taught me a lot. It taught me so much. And I'd much rather see... I mean, do you know the stats about young black men? Young black children in general and, and, and working... It's abysmal. You talk about something that's, that, is, that is setting back a community of people. Look into that. Look into the statistics behind black youths and, and part-time and seasonal work and working in general. I'm, I'm just telling you. Just look at what real Americans are dealing with. Okay? Not, not illegal immigrants. Not children who were promised something by a guy who who just really i mean the president before trump just he just wanted smiles and accolades that's all i got out of the guy he was a guy who wanted to help everybody out and you know we've all been in that position maybe not the guy to run the country though he ran the country he ran it directly into the ground, it seems like. The more I, the more I sit back and, re, and look at the things that have happened, the debt that has been... <clears throat> but do you want to hear my major gripe with, with the idea of DACA? It's bad enough that the kids have been robbed of jobs. I know what everybody's... All the liberals and progressive people are going to come to me and say... They're going to post on my website or go to my email and they're going to say things like this. They're going to say, your kids wouldn't do those jobs. American kids wouldn't do those jobs. Yes, because you bring them up in a climate like that. Because people bring their children up with an air of, I am not going to do that. I'm not going to pick strawberries. Okay, so then they're not going to do them. So then they're not going to do them. But what if instead of funding welfare for illegal aliens, not just from the south of the border, but from all over this world... What about if following the immigration laws and not taking on further, further, further debts? Debts that we'll never be able to pay. Debts that will topple the nation one day. Oh, yes, debts that will topple the nation one day. You think America's going to be on top forever? Do you think that this country's going to be on top forever? It can't be on top. Look at Europe. Look what is happening to Europe after they take a speck of immigration. A speck. They've taken a speck of illegal immigration in comparison to what we absorb on an annual basis. Right? Refugees. You know what I'm talking about. Every country's bankrupt in Europe. You think we're going to stay on top by bringing in everybody and every mother and every cousin and every uncle and giving them a check and giving them a job and giving them a this and giving them a house and giving them a phone? No. No. The dollar is taking a beating. Yeah, it might be up today. But trust me, the world knows what the dollar is. Whether you're, you're ignorant enough to believe it or not, 
The dollar is a worthless. It's been worthless and it's getting more worthless. And all it takes, this is all it takes, is for China to be able to say to the world, we're backing our currency by gold. For India, any, na any nation that has the, the, the balls to back their currency by gold, and you can check on how much gold China's buying, India's buying. They are not messing around. But as soon as someone convinces the world that yeah, we really don't need this American reserve currency to trade our oil in, we don't need this American reserve currency, because whether you know it or not, all these trades happen in American currency, in the dollar. Because they all understand that it, even though it's laden with debt, it will be held up, right? They know that the reputation is there, but that doesn't mean it's going to be there forever. Hundred trillion in debt? What about when we break the quadrillion? Within, mark my words, what are we, 20 trillion debt now? We'll break quadrillion in the next five years. You don't believe me? I'll say it right now on the I Am Liberty Show. We're 20, 20 trillion in debt right now. 20, 40, 60, 80, 100? <clears throat> well, maybe 10 years. Let's do 10. Let's do 10 years. We'll be in quadrillions. Quadrillion. You probably It's something you said in the schoolyard. You didn't even think it was real. Quadrillions in debt. <laughs> it's, it's laughable if it weren't laughable. If it weren't laughable, it'd be laughable. So now we're touching on economic collapse, right? Once the dollar tanks, once the real price of goods goes up, once they were no longer able to subsidize farmers, all of a sudden we've got real problems. All of a sudden food costs what it really costs. Imports cost what they really cost. And you find yourself looking at one another going, what happened? We were living high on the hog. We wanted to take care of the entire world, and it didn't work out. You see what I mean by this holistic approach to the problems of the world? This is a very depressing situation here. I'm sorry. That's just what I'm feeling right now. But my major gripe with DACA, this is my major gripe. My father will be 70 years old in three years. 70. 70. He climbs ladders and paints for a living at 67 years old. 67. Why does he do it? Because he gets pennies. Because he gets pennies from the government for Social Security. That's why. That's why the 67-year-old man has to wake up and go paint shutters and climb ladders. And if he... If he weren't such a superman, if he weren't such a superman, it'd be a real issue. It'd be a very real issue for my parents. 67 years old, pennies, nothing. Isn't you, how do you work for 60 plus years? How do you work for 60 plus years? And still not get enough money to live off for the rest of your life. And my parents, listen to me. These aren't people living high on the hog, okay? They don't need much to get by. But even that lifestyle has been robbed from them. Why? Well, you tell me. What do you think? What do you think? 400 billion here, welfare there. What do you think? Free housing here. What do you think? Do you know how many people are turning 65 a day in this country? You know how many people are pulling from Social Security? Social Security, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, such a sin, it's unbelievable. The fact that we can't take care of our elderly... Who've worked their whole lives to make this nation great. I mean, in a capitalist society, you have to be able to take care of the people who run the businesses their whole life. 
Don't you think? Well, when you take care of the rest of the world, you can't do both. That's the end of it. At the end of the day, that's the truth. When you take care of the entire world, then you have to work people into their 70s, into their 80s. Sorry. It's just what has to happen. It's a terrifying thing. It's terrifying. You want me to talk about hurricanes? The hurricanes are getting bigger and badder and scarier and... The world is, I think the world is probably the only ally we have. A lot of people want to say that the hurricanes and all that, climate change and the world is turning against us. I think the natural threats in this world are, are the least of our worries. The least of our worries right now. Could that change? I don't know. There's a lot of seismic activity in Yellowstone lately. Some people got their heads twisted around about that. You never know what that could be. But I'm telling you, like never before has it been clear to start preparing. And not even just preparing, but you've got to prepare for the world that you're in. You know, it's one thing to get some Tupperware containers, some Rubbermaids, and fill them up with stuff for hurricanes, fill them up with stuff for, you know, economic collapse. You've got to start positioning your life in an entirely different way. This is, this is the reality. Whether you want to hear it, whether you like it, whether it makes you nervous, whether you turn the show off because you don't want to listen to it, I don't really care what you do. There's nobody sponsoring this show that I have to make sure an audience listens. Hey, make sure you buy this such and such a product and it'll do this for you. The, the, I, the age of advertising like that is over anyway, by the way. But that said, that said, listen to me. The traditional life is not going to work for you in the future. If you think you can mosey into a, a job and sit down at your desk and type some data in, it's not a long-term strategy, even if you're making a good salary. You need to make it on your own. And I'm going to tell you what I've told you forever. You have to make it. If you're not going to be an entrepreneur... So if you're, not, if you're not going to be an entrepreneur and start a business, I understand it. It's a great risk. You need a great idea. You need things. Things need to work out properly. If you're not going to go that route, then you need to start taking advantage of the millions and millions of entrepreneurs in this world. You need to position yourself as an expert in whatever it is that you know. Learn, read, Get better, become the best, become an expert at what you know, and position yourself in a way that you can help entrepreneurs at a reasonable price. Get yourself into a profession that will not be dominated by robots, will not be dominated by automation, because believe me, it's coming. It's coming and it's coming fast. You have to position yourself as the ruler of your own kingdom. That's all there is to it. You can't be dependent on a company. You're not going to get a pension. For the most part, you're not getting a pension anymore. And even a pension. You want to talk about pensions. How about Detroit? What happened to pensions in Detroit? Gone. They robbed the pensions in Detroit. You've got to position yourself. You have to own your career. You have to create your career. You have to create your career and, and with longevity in mind. With the idea that I'm going to provide a, a unique service or product that will outlast my life. That's the only answer. And if that product or service won't work in the retail market, maybe it will work in the entrepreneurial market. What a lot of people can't wrap their head around is that you don't have to sell to the general public anymore. You can sell to the entrepreneur. It's an amazing market. You have to get into it. You have to. I'm not selling you a web course. I'm not telling. No, I'm telling you, you're not retiring. All right, your 401k, whatever. Okay, sure. But for the for the most part, a you're not going to retire the average person because they're not going to put enough money away to do it. You're not going to get social security by the time you're old enough to retire if you're my age in your 30s. And uh, let me tell you another secret about retirement. That's how you die. It goes like this. It goes working and accomplishing, retirement, then coffin. 
All right. So what you do is you work and you work and you work and you work. And then one day, hopefully, you drop dead from exhaustion. and You don't have to sit in a hospital and rot away and disappear into nothingness. Because the moment you stop working and someone tricks you into retiring anyway, you're, you're already one foot in the, in the grave, in my opinion. From what I've seen. From what I've seen of people. You know, unless you're really strong-willed and you like to get out and do a lot of things, keep yourself busy. But for the most part, people finally get done slaving. Because that's what you're doing. You're slaving. They finally get done slaving. And they decide, you know what, I'm going to chill for a while. And uh, that's that. You want some more? What, do you want some more cynicism? What do you, <laughs> are you not depressed enough? Have you not been depressed enough by this this podcast? Listen, this is just a reality. Sometimes you need a reality check. You know, the last episode was very touchy-feely and nice, and let me give you advice and that whole thing. Now it's just a reality. This is why I give you the advice. Because you're headed into a harsh world, and you have to be prepared. You have to be prepared for disaster because... In creating this great career that you have to fall in love with and you have to figure out how to make money off of, you also have to be prepared to guess what? One day it could go away. One day it could disappear because the world falls apart. More than likely, your business is going to rely on the uh, internet at some point. So how does an EMP do if your, your internet business is how you pay the bills? What happens? Even for me, a freelance writer, right? If, if, we, if we continue to pussyfoot with Kim Jong-un and we allow him to get a bomb that's capable of detonating high enough in the sky to shut out most of the power grid. How many people are ready for that? How many people are ready for that? Listen to me. The world is changing and you have no say. That's the scary part. You didn't get to vote on DACA. You don't get to vote on AI. You don't get to vote on what Google does. You don't get to vote on whether or not uh, statues go down or come up or whatever. You, you have no control. And when people have no control is when they go out of their mind. So we're going to see a lot of people go out of their mind. And I'm just telling you, this is the reality. Get yourself as prepared as you can. And when you get overwhelmed like me, you go watch a good horror movie and have a drink or two. And you'll return to the Earth realm in a little bit of better shape. <laughs> and uh, that's the best you can do in this life. Keep trucking. All right, I'm going to go in and watch this movie. When I come back out, I'll be in a better mood. We'll talk about it if you're interested. If not, turn the podcast off now uh, and I'll see you live my next show or when my next show posts or when the next uh, well, maybe I don't know maybe I'll know so you want to talk about Pennywise should we talk about not the band? <laughs> you want to talk about Pennywise? Actually, it's probably more worth talking about the children. Because the children in the film, in it, they stole the show, man. They stole the show. The representation of teenage boys and girls in that movie was so spot on. It was like nothing degenerated Hollywood would ever dare do, which was amazing to me. It showed children to be exactly what they are in the summer, in school, the vulgarity, the, the hypersexuality of young boys. And it was, it was incredibly refreshing. It was hilarious. It was a great time. It was a, great, it was a time capsule to sit back and watch these, you know, little teenage boys cursing like sailors talking about each other's you know mothers and sisters in sexually explicit ways just to get under the skin of their their fellow man they made the movie i mean the kids made the movie now the malevolent beast that is pennywise was also done very well i think what is the guy's name bill skarsgård he did a phenomenal job phenomenal job i mean eerie just as eerie as can be what I really liked 
where 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 they made Pennywise where they made the difference in Pennywise, right? The original mini series Pennywise was it was a scary little monster for sure. I mean, freak you out, there's no doubt about it. But where Pennywise excelled was not in like the stop motion cinema cinematic effects that they employed not in these sort of um suedo or pseudo rather not in like the pseudo what was what was the movie called with linda blair not in the pseudo linda blair sort of movements that they gave him from time to time that wasn't really where he was most terrifying right the shocking scary and you know stop motion sort of movement that he had what made for me okay now let me tell you that these types of things i don't know why i used to be completely terrified of monsters and i mean just to a point where it was unhealthy and actually affected my health terrified freddy krueger jason Candyman, chucky all that just mortified terrified leather face the whole nine yards when i watched him what i appreciated more than anything was the underlying fact that whoever whoever wanted to create this version of Pennywise wanted to create a creature that was just a hair off from being a human clown. You know, when you see him, when he's not trying to scare, when he's just speaking, and you look at the details of him, you see something. You know how you run into somebody on the street and they're just off? There's just something like the eye, the, it's that hair or the hairline or, you know, the mo the movements. You look into the face, it's like the opposite of the golden ratio. And you see something about a person that's just off. Well, with Pennywise in this movie in particular, this, this guy was just, it was perfect. It was perfect. The, the eye was just a little cocked, right? The voice was a little strange. The drooling, it was a lot of drooling. And you looked at the creature and you said to yourself, Oh, this isn't this isn't anything normal here. This is something different. And you also I could also appreciate the fact that somebody thought this out. They thought it out, they said, Alright, let's cock the eye to the to the left a little. Right? Let's give him a little exaggerated speech. Let's give him this kind of off look. I'm going to tell you something, man. The ending was a little lackluster, but other than that, the movie was great. It really was. The kids the kids stole the show. There's no doubt about it. Would it be terrifying to the average person? Sure, no doubt about it. The, the, the clown was, was absolutely terrifying at times. Uh, the various forms, also terrifying, but... I'm telling you right now, the story is told by the children. It was great. And I don't know if the book was that good. I don't know if the dialect or the dialogue between the children was that good in the book. But I'll tell you what, whoever whoever did it did an amazing job. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I had two, um, what were they called, chocolate shake stouts beforehand. So that made it an enjoyable experience as well. Even though I had to urinate so much that I'm sure the people down down the <laughs> down the line from me were probably cursing me. But all in all, I saw a lot in the children. You know, I forgot that the story was based on two brothers, one older, one younger. And that the younger brother dies. That had a little bit of an effect on me being a father of two. But it also reminded you of what being the, the the difference of a child and a man and how little it is the difference of a child and a man and how little it is and how the whole world depends on nothing but bigger hairier meaner children to run it and we spent the first half hour of this show talking about how how we're teetering and tottering on the edge of edge of oblivion and you watch a movie like that and you realize that god the children are everything. The children are, are everything. They're gonna they're either gonna sink this thing or float this thing. You know, you get to that point, you get to that sec little sector in your mind, and you realize how important the children are. 
How you doing, ma'am? You know, you see children being bullied in the movie. You see them being uh, affected negatively by bad parents. It's one of the things I always worry about, right? You bring your kids up and you know all the faults. It's the same thing with having a relationship. You spend a lot of your life seeing bad relationships, seeing bad parenting, and you, just, you think to yourself, you know what, I'm going to be the best man, the best husband I can. I'm going to be the best father I can. I was talking to my mother about this the other day, and I said, you know, this is good advice for young fathers. But I, saw, I told my mother, you know, I work from home. I spend a lot of time with my kids. I spend tons of time with my kids. I make sure my kids get what they want and have what they need. They don't see much hardship, and I concern myself with how that's going to make them turn out. You know, what are they going to, what are they going to be like if they don't have to suffer like I suffered? You know. And you know what my mother said? This is for people out there who are making it. It's a very important advice that she gave me. My mother, listen, I'm. When you watch parents up close for years and years and years, you're always going to find faults, right? You're always going to learn from those faults. And my parents are human, just like the rest of us. Just like the rest of us, right? We all have faults. We all, some of us can hide our faults better than others. Some of us, we can't. Some of the faults, they sit right on the surface and you can't do anything about it. But I'm going to tell you what, my parents... They've always given me these little nuggets of advice that were so important to my life. And the timing was so important that it changed almost everything. And I'm talking to her and I'm telling her, you know, I don't want my kids to be weak. I don't want them to turn out, you know, bad because they've had a life. I provided them a life. My wife and I, I shouldn't say I, my wife and I have provided them with a life where they get the things they want, they do the things they want, and, uh, you know, we don't have lights being shut off, water being shut off, there's no, we don't fight about money, there's no real money issues in my household, we don't go without, you know, that type of thing. And that radically morphs a child, and morphs the way that they think, I'm sure, and I told my mother I was concerned. What is it going to do to my kids to be so secure, you know, what is it going to do to them? Because I almost value the life that I led. You know, I value the idea of adversity and the struggle. I think it makes you a better person. And you know what my mom said? She, to she told me, Jim, life is hard. Life is hard, and life is going to be hard on those boys whether you like it or not. And maybe it won't be while they're six and seven years old, but once they get into middle school, once they get into high school, once they start working, they're going to run into bullies, they're going to run into the troubles that we all run into. So don't worry about making life hard on them. Don't worry about making life hard on them. And what she told me, which is the most important part of parenting forever, no matter what, no matter what, the most important part is keeping the communication line open. You knock down, drag out, fight, you battle. You get into arguments, you don't agree with each other, you you know, none of it matters if the kid can come to you. There's too many people who listen to this show and I don't feel it right to explain the true nature of my parents' relationship and mine right and their struggles and their faults but I will tell you this crazy things happened in my parents life that affected our relationship but what I always found was that I would return to them I would work my ass off I'd go to school I'd go to college I'd work nights and weekends and holidays in kitchens as a chef right losing my mind behind the fire tickets chattering off the box all night long I'd get a free night and you know what I would do I wouldn't call up a bunch of dudes who would get me into a bunch of trouble you know what I would do I would usually go to my parents house and I talked to them about my life and I talked to them about my my girlfriend and I talked to them about my dog and I talked to them about my hopes and my dreams and we'd laugh. We'd, we'd laugh at the struggles of life. My parents, better than anyone, any people I've ever met, are so incredible at, at deflecting the struggles of life. 
you know, they laugh it off, no matter what it is. On, on her deathbed, my mother will be joking and laughing, I can promise you that. And, uh, you know, you just get the sense that when you see a movie like that that is so focused around children, you understand the importance. You understand almost the irrelevance of you at a certain point. You know, once you drop children onto this planet, you understand the... I want to do great things. I want to write great things. I want to be noticed. I want to be remembered. You know, the ego. I want to make a lot of money. I want to be... I want the whole world to think I'm smart. I want everybody to think that I'm a smart guy. I know something, and I wrote something, and I'm remembered for something. But at the end of the day, you realize it's all... You're now in charge of making cool people. Nothing more important in the world. In this world in particular. Because you are vastly outnumbered by people making crazy people. People having six kids in a, in a, in a row home, smoking crack, doing drugs, bringing them up around multiple men or multiple women. And these kids are, are racked. They have no, no, nothing. So if you have the means, if you have the ability, what one can do, one must do. It is your duty as a parent to sink as much time into those children and you know what, to, to put something onto the planet that's going to make a difference. Something on the planet that's going to help someone one day, to put a person on the planet who's going to be cool. Who's going to be cool and who's going to do the right thing. That's it. That's all it comes down to. Everything else is for nil when you think about it. What are you, 30, 40 years old? You got 60 years left at best. At best, probably 30. <laughs> you got about 50 solid years under your belt. And you know what happens after that? You're dead and the world's left with your kids. So do us all a favor and, uh, you know, focus on making them as good as you can. I know my listeners will. You guys are great people. I'll see you th- next time. I don't know when next time's going to be because I don't know when this is going to go up. But I'll talk to you soon. All right? Love you.